The elves were the first to possess the written word, and have the longest reaching records, although their history is now a broken and shattered legacy, with many gaps related to the collapse of their first empire into ruin and devastation. The Dwarves of Rule boast the only unbroken and continuous civilization in western Emerin. The establishment of Gord as their home for their codex took place more than 2,000 years before the time of Synod, who would begin the era of recorded history amongst the human Menite settlements. For virtually all of human recorded history, Eastern and Western Emerin have been divided. Little was known by humanity of Eastern Emerin. All that remains are the partially preserved records carried by Ios by the surviving refugees of the Empire of Laos, the first great civilization of the age. They had rarely shared tales of their ancient past with outsiders, however. In those ancient times, after elves spread and multiplied for generations across northern eastern Emerin, the Divine Court made themselves known and set them on a path of unification. The gods took an active hand in shaping their ways. Among the first tasks required of the leaders of the tribes was the construction of numerous great fanes, the temples of the elves, to facilitate communion with the gods. Connecting these gave rise to the Empire of Laos. While the unification of the scattered tribes was a time of warfare and strife, it taught the Laosians the art of battle that served them well against external threats in the centuries that followed. Surrounded on all sides by aggressive and more primitive tribes of various species, including the ruthless and vicious savages called the Scorn, Laos committed to expanding, patrolling its borders, and building of vast cities. The continent itself was different in that age, without the vast sweeping deserts that fill the center of it today. This region was crossed by myriad rivers dividing fertile farmlands. The golden age of this empire would rise and pass into memory before the first great cities of mankind even rose. The oldest towers of Nysil, its capital, were already old and starting to crumble before the first stones were laid for the ruic city of Gord. The empire might well have encompassed all of Emerin in time, if not for a disaster of its own devising. There is evidence of another ancient civilization of eastern Emerin, one often overlooked due to its obscurity. The elves of Laos had contact with a reclusive race of giants that occupied several settlements in northeastern Emerin, adjacent to and within the Sun Eater Mountains. These giants stand over 20 feet tall and are said to possess both tremendous strength as well as extreme longevity, among other supernatural traits. Even at the height of their culture in ancient times, they were never very numerous, and now fewer only than a hundred live in the last of their mountain cities, Baymoth. Over the centuries, some few of these giants ventured west, and their passage inspired a number of legends. The most well-known of these was of Colossa, a giant who came to the human city of Corvus during the Orgoth occupation, converted to the faith of Morrow, and is credited with numerous heroic acts during the War of Freedom. In the glass peaks of western Emerin, the dwarven clans descended from the Great Fathers fell into a conflict that escalated into a terrible conflagration. The words of the Great Fathers had not been forgotten, yet the edicts of the Codex became twisted and used to justify feuds of a scope beyond all reason as clan beset clan and sought one another's extinction. The younger clans felt oppressed by the elder and more powerful ones and banded together to seize prestigious holdings. These younger clans then fought one another over dividing the spoils of their victory. This conflict was called the Feud of Ages, the only major internal war in Rulic history, a period viewed by all Rule folk with shame. Starting in 8500 BR, the Feud of Ages is believed to have lasted 300 years. Although the conflict during this time was intermediate and irregular, occupying both smaller and larger battles as clans often switched sides, changed allegiances, and both seized and abandoned significant claims. Control of mountain passes and other routes of trade and travel, such as the rivers of the Great Glass Peaks and access to the inland sea of Lake Armsdeep, 
were primary sources of contention. The end of the Feud of Ages is closely tied with the founding of the great city of Gord in 8200 BR, now the capital of Rule, the most ancient of the great cities of Western Imran. Several of the foundational buildings of Gord are already sacred, connected to the Great Fathers and their clay wives. The thirteen clans that still bore their names and deemed most closely descended from the Great Fathers came to Gord in the spirit of their progenitors to unite and join their estates and holdings. The most violent and vindictive of the younger warring clans who would not bow were cast out. The fate of these exiled clans is not well documented. Some likely settled on the fringes of the region and eventually rejoined rule, but others went elsewhere, either to establish communities that have been yet undiscovered or to perish outright in obscurity. The Thirteen Stone Clans restored the Codex and created the government but which would become rule, with Gord as its center. The leaders of each of these clans became the Stone Lords and together governed and arbitrated disputes amongst the clans until 7500 BR when the Stone Lords consented to the founding of the Moot of the Hundred Houses, whereupon the Hundred Greatest Clans would together oversee the laws and arbitration of rule, recording all disputes and their resolutions in the Growing Codex. While duels and clan feuds on a smaller scale were an ordinary aspect of Rulic politics, all such strife was carefully governed by the laws of the Moot and its stern judges, and never again was the general welfare of rule placed at risk. Unlike some other races, the dwarves did not multiply in very great numbers or seek to spread beyond the glass peaks, and so while their civilization slowly expanded, it remained isolated from the barbaric tribes beyond the mountains. The passes providing entrance to the rule were heavily fortified and garrisoned, giving rule uniquely formidable borders and allowing them to easily repel smaller and less ordered groups that might threaten them. While contact and trade was established between the Rulic Moot and delegates from the Empire of Laos, interactions between them were limited and wary. As Laos continued to expand, the rural folk prepared for the inevitability of war. There are scholars who believe that Minoff's chosen tribes established now forgotten civilizations, but there has been little evidence to support these claims. If any such empires existed, they were swallowed by the sands to the east of the area now recognized as Western Imran. What is known is that the largest tribe of Minites undertook a pilgrimage west following their priests on a journey where their passage was challenged by the godless until at last they reached the shores of the Meridius. Here they founded the first great city of mankind, Ichthyr. At this holy site the words of the sacred canon of the true law were made manifest on stones as the first writings inscribed by the very hand of Minoff himself. It was the study of these words that brought about the knowledge of reading and writing to humanity, one of Minop's great gifts. While first inscribed in stone, the words of the true law would eventually be copied and translated countless times. It remains the sacred text of the Minite faith, although there are some conflicting iterations and many of the original stone inscriptions have crumbled to dust over the passage of time. Historians have carefully examined these and other copies of ancient writings from these early days, believe that Ichthyr was settled somewhere around 6500 BR, which marks the first recorded Minite civilization. Passages of the True Law speak of kings that would arise chosen by the will of Minoth and whose holiness allowed them to serve as conduits for the divine. These priest kings are the most revered leaders of the Minite faith each capable of manifesting awe-inspiring miracles in the name of the creator of man. Sinod was the first great priest king of Ichthyr. He was said to be able to turn ash into grain and salt into nectar. It was through him that Minoff delivered the gift of the sheaf to his people, and by his teachings Ichthyr flourished and allowed its growing numbers to be fed. He implemented aqueducts and irrigation and organized the laborers of the city into quarrying stone which to build both houses and walls. By his guiding hand the Minites were exalted above the warring tribes that surrounded them. As early civilization grew, so did the needs of the priesthood to organize. 
Synod set the first hierarchy of the Mennite faith and its clergy in place. His priests led the warriors of the faith into battle against both the godless savages that surrounded the city, but also against the beasts of the wild themselves. Synod amazingly lived for four centuries guiding his people, his longevity another of the creator's miracles. After he was gone, the region continued to serve as a cradle of civilization. By 5500 BR, a warrior of the faith named Belcor and a sage priest named Geth led an exodus northward, seeking to spread the gift of civilization. Dragons exist in the old legends as fiendishly powerful monsters, once thought to be the embodiments of the devourer worm. They were imperishable terrors that passed overhead on shadowy wings and breathed fire on any that offended them. As scholars learned more of dragons, they became less certain of their nature, for they have little in common with anything else that walks, flies, or swims on cane. All dragons originate from a single progenitor, Taruk, called the Dragon Father. For the last 16 centuries, this creature has been worshipped as a god by those dwelling in the island empire west of Imran. Those who worship the Dragon Father claim he has always been a part of the world, although he never participated in the frenzy of fertility and generations that have gave rise to life on Cain. Taruk and the other dragons may not be alive by any ordinary reckoning. They do not breed or propagate as some other species do, but possess immortality rooted in a heartstone, an indestructible crystal called an athak. Toruk's worshippers believe that at some point in ages past, Toruk became tired of his solitary existence and created a brood to serve him. He divided his athak, and from each splinter, a new dragon came into being, each uniquely terrible. This act did not proceed as intended, as the dragons were too similar to their father. Each possessed inhuman pride and thought itself superior to all others. They refused to bow to their father and outright rebelled. Toruk was mightier than any one of them individually, but together they were a formidable force. After a titanic struggle amid the skies of Cain, the dragons scattered. From that point forward, Toruk sought to hunt down his progeny and gather the pieces of his essence to undo his mistake. The other dragons in their scattered lairs kept watch for their father and remained ready to flee from him at a moment's notice. In the meanwhile, they took out their aggressions on lesser creatures that crawled upon the world. Many dragons earned their own sagas and legends as they laired up atop inaccessible mountain peaks or other remote locations. Names such as Ashenfos, Blightergas, Charsong, Everblight, Halfang, and Scalefang prompt nearly as much fear and dread in their legends as the Dragon Father does in his own. On the few occasions a dragon has been defeated, often at great cost by vast armies, they have shown the ability to reform flesh and scale from their attack and rise again. The only permanent extinction of the dragons has been when one has fallen to the claws of their father or to another of their own kind. Galvong, Nectar, Pyromalific, and Skaze are names of dragons that have fallen in the preceding centuries. The human dating system used throughout Western Imran divides history into two distinct epochs defined by the struggle against the Orgoth. Older dates count backwards from the start of the rebellion and are listed as BR, or Before Rebellion while most recent dates count forward and are listed as AR, or After Rebellion. Certain other cultures use a different standard for counting dates. Rule designates the year zero as the founding of Gord, so they consider the current year to be 8808 G. Dates before the founding of Gord are designated by an X. Iolson's dates are based on the Cataclysm, which is indicated by the symbol Coret, in the appropriate location of the date. The year 608 AR is Coret 4574 by Iosin Reckoning. Ruick and Iosin dates are not used in this series. Beyond the fields of civilization, spreading from Ichthyr, 
Struggles for dominance and survival occupied bands of Trokan, Orgrin, Gobbers, and the tribes of humanity that had forsaken the Creator. The one uniting aspect shared by these wild tribes was a reverence for the Devourer Worm, embodied in countless tomatetic forms. Shamans of these barbaric tribes supplicated the worm through bloody sacrifices, invoking their own miracles deemed utterly unholy by the Menites. The rites of these groups involved cannibalism, self-mutilation, and bloodletting, conducted either upon one another or outsiders they would gather in strength and raid fringe settlements. By and large, the Menite communities had the greater discipline and the capacity to organize armed defenses, but the menace of the Mogur steadily grew, particularly as the barbarians began to gather in numbers. Though the Mogur possessed little organization and battles between competing tribes were very common, they shared an identity drawn from the shamans and their rites. Bands of raiders would prey upon even well-defended rival villages or isolated townships. The Mogur learned to communicate with one another, creating a mongrel tongue unique to themselves, drawn from desperate dialects of a thousand tribes. They emulated the writings of the Menites, carving into stone a crude Ruic alphabet. Shamans discovered that these inscriptions empowered their mystical rites. Barter and news were spread amongst one Mogur tribe to another, with runners sent to challenge rivals or to call a gathering for battle. Records from the Menites of these early days speak of attacks by the Mogur in a terrified language, describing them as, quote, half man, half beast, unquote. Certain humans who have embraced the worm demonstrated the ability to transform, grow in size and strength while filled with a murderous madness. In modern times, such savages still exist in the tribes called the Tharn, which are most certainly direct descendants of the Mogur. The sight and sounds of these blood-maddened warriors with their pounding drums and great howls was horrified and blasphemous to the settled peoples. The Mogur poured from their wildernesses and delighted in murder, feasting upon the fallen, willing to destroy anything that crosses their paths. While the Menites began to spread their civilization and the Mogur began to band together, a great work was underway in the east that would forever change the face of Emerin. For within the empire of Laos, a message spread from the great fanes that the gods sought to walk among them. The greatest priests communed with the divine court and discerned their desire to create what becomes known as the Bridge of Worlds, a great structure that would facilitate the crossing between the Veld and Cain. The gods had discovered that in the passing millennia, there had been a thickening of the barriers between the afterlife and the world of the living. While mortal souls were light enough and insubstantial enough to pass through the membrane separating these worlds, the gods could only do so by exerting tremendous energies, making it very difficult for them to bestow blessings on their mortal followers. The Bridge of Worlds would allow the gods to pass to Cain whenever they wished. Its construction would be shared between the mortal and the divine, with half of the bridge built in the Veld and the other half extending into the sky from Narsil, the capital of the empire. Directed by the gods, the people of Laos began their undertaking circa 4250 BR. Arcane secrets were passed to them through the priesthood, including the techniques by which force of will could be directed and magnified to lift and manipulate massive pieces of stone and metal. Through miracles of both engineering and the arcane, construction of the Bridge of Worlds began. It was not required that the Laosans understood every principle of the work, but only that they followed the instructions of the gods. Great arcane generators were erected beneath the superstructure of the towering bridge, which would be the largest and most impressive engineering accomplishment ever attempted by mortal hands. While the bridge was being erected, the lattice of metal sigils was inlaid across the streets of the capital. Extending for miles into the surrounding lanes, an arcane foundation that distributed energy from the Cyclopean structure. 
bolstered by their tremendous longevity and inspired by divine visions. Multiple generations came to maturity and joined their parents and grandparents in contributing to the ongoing labor. Ioson records recovered from Lyos suggested that the bridge reached completion by 4000 BR. As the date of completion neared, the people of Lyos were filled with eager anticipation and prepared a great festival to celebrate the arrival of the gods. The streets of Nysil were filled with pilgrims. The already crowded city filled to twice its normal capacity with teeming throngs concentrated near the base of the bridge where the hopeful intended to greet their gods. Unfortunately, the hopes of the Lyosan people could not forestall the coming cataclysm. What went wrong is a mystery as much to the ancients as the scholars of the present, and even the gods themselves must not know, since otherwise it would seem unfathomable that they would have gone forward with their plans. The fact that the divine court was neither omniscient nor omnipotent was proven in this time to come. Not knowing the doom that awaited them, the Lyosans activated the great mechanisms of the Bridge of Worlds. For a moment, all seemed well, as the eight gods of the Divine Court entered the world of Cain for the first time. Just at that moment, the bridge exploded in a torrent of vast and sweeping power. The explosive force was so great that Imran itself cracked and sundered. Along what was once the vibrant Hellas River opened the abyss, a chasm so deep that it reached the hot arteries of the world where molten stone flows like blood. Nysil, once a glorious capital, was instantly obliterated, together with millions of Lyosans who had gathered there. Where stood was nothing more than a gaping chasm, a wound in the world itself. The gods endured, but they found the world consumed with devastation. Unnatural blue-white fire spread in the wake of the explosion, flames that burned indefinitely without impairing fuel and could not be extinguished. The very stones burnt like cordwood. Weather patterns across Imarin changed irrevocably, and what was a small desert to the far southwest of Nysil became a vast waste. Along the abyss, Freakish energies combined with seismic upheavals gave birth to the Stormlands, a region of unrelenting lightning and rain that still persists thousands of years later. The Empire of Lyos ceased to exist in a moment, delivered into annihilation. The destruction went far beyond the capital, causing death and carnage across all the major cities of the Empire. Those inhabiting the fringes starved or were set upon by predators and beasts, including the fresh horrors arisen in the wake of the arcane devastation. The empire might have been erased without a single survivor, if not for the intervention of the weakened but still prescient gods of the divine court. The eight gods used their powers to shelter as many thousands of the refugees as they could. Together they fled to the west, where they would find shelter amid the isolated veil they had come to name Ios. Records pointing to the cataclysm can be found in ancient human legends. In the annals of the ancient sage Argarant, it was called the Time of the Burning Sky, a tremendous bright light in the east that presaged the destruction, where the night sky became like day, but with a baleful intensity that soon faded and was replaced by howling winds and storms. The earth opened up and swallowed entire towns in the eastern fringes, while a rain of fire lasting 60 days and 60 nights blasted the region, creating what would be sequentially called the Bloodstone Marshes. Lakes dried up, livestock became barren, and dangerous creatures fled before the wild weather, wreaking havoc wherever they passed. The Mennites scattered, and most moved up to the coast to the fertile regions near the Black River they would soon call Calasia. The city of ancient Ichthyr, the first city of man, was abandoned and would not be reclaimed for thousands of years. Sometime around 4800 BR, eight centuries before the time of the burning sky, a strong civilization began to take root in a valley amidst the heavily forested region now called the Thornwood. 
It is thought that the first leaders of Mord were an offshoot sect of the Menite Exodus led by Geth seven centuries earlier. There are fragmentary passages that hint of a schism that led to the founders of Mord turning from their Menite teachings, although inheriting many of the gifts of civilization provided by Sinon. Little is known of the culture and religious beliefs of Mord, although in legends it is a kingdom associated with darkness and corruption. Whether the taint of Mord existed from its foundings or festered much later on, the warriors of the Valley of Mord managed to drive back the Mogor tribes and secure their own legacy. The people of Mord explored occult rituals that would have never been condoned by the Menite priesthood. Warfare with the Mogor gave rise to an aggressive and violent civilization, one with convoluted and brutal internal politics based on the competition between rival warlords. The Kingdom of Mord was not united until 3500 BR after the warlords of ten smaller fiefdoms came to an uneasy accord. This allowed the fledgling kingdom to prosper against neighboring tribes. Unearthed records suggest dark packs and conspiracies at the heart of Mord domination. Long before humanity mastered the arcane, the lords of Mord were rumored to possess terrible powers, including the ability to make corpses rise from their graves and take up weapons to become tireless guardians. Descriptions of battles by the neighboring Midar describe serpentine monsters descending from the sky on bat-like wings in answer to the call of Moric generals. Other monsters erupted from below the earth to swallow enemies whole. Some of this has been dismissed as superstition, but all stories imply that the leaders of Mord had access to lore mankind was not meant to know. The tainted gains made by Mord as a civilization would foster evil within the Thornwood that still plagues the nations to this very day. Hello fellow Warmer Horde fans, if you enjoyed this video make sure to like, comment, and subscribe below and hit that bell notification to let you know when I drop my next video. Also if you're still new to Warmer Hordes make sure to check out my other Warmer Horde lore videos found in both the description and on screen. Thank you and enjoy your day.